Hello viewers, I, Dr. Tehseena Shireen, is back on this Open Educational Resources on the YouTube channel, an initiative of the Zoological Society of Assam, taken up to reach out to the students globally during this global crisis due to pandemic COVID-19. So let me continue with the second part with the hope that you have understood and learned the previous lecture. So let us begin. What shall we learn from the second part? Firstly, source of energy for muscle contraction. As we all know that this phenomenon requires large amount of energy which is supplied by ATP. We will unravel the various sources from where muscle cells obtain ATP. Next, we should understand the chemical and molecular basis of muscle contraction by virtue of which an electrical stimulus is converted to a mechanical response also called excitation contraction coupling followed by the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. Finally, we shall also learn briefly about cardiac muscle and smooth muscle contraction, types of muscle contraction ending up with their properties namely muscle fatigue, twitch, tetanus and summation. Now let us learn about the ATP use and their sources during muscle contraction. As we all know that muscle contraction depends on energy supplied by ATP. Muscle cells obtain ATP from several sources. The ATP is split to form ADP which transfers energy from the ATP molecule to the contracting machinery of the muscle fiber. Then the ADP is rephosphorylated to form new ATP within another fraction of a second, which allows the muscle to continue its contraction. There are several sources of the energy for this rephosphorylation. Now, the first source is most of the immediate energy supply is held in as an energy pool of the compound creatine phosphate or phosphocreatine which carries a high energy phosphate bond similar to the bonds of ATP. After a molecule of ATP has been split and yielded its energy, the resulting ADP molecule is readily rephosphorylated to ATP by the high energy phosphate group from a creatine phosphate molecule. The creatine phosphate pool is restored by ATP from the various cellular metabolic pathways. Now let us look into the second source, glucose. Glucose is a preferred fuel for skeletal muscle contraction at higher levels of exercise. At maximal work levels Almost all the energy used is derived from glucose produced by glycogen breakdown in muscle tissue and from blood bone glucose from dietary sources. The breakdown and subsequent entry of glucose into the glycolytic pathway is catalyzed by the enzyme phosphorylase A. Each glucose molecule produces two ATP and two molecules of pyruvic acid which can be used of in aerobic aspiration in case of presence of oxygen or converted to lactic acid in case oxygen is not available which may contribute to muscle fatigue. This generally occurs during strenuous exercise when high amounts of energy are needed but oxygen cannot be sufficiently delivered to muscle. Now, the third and the final source of energy is oxidative metabolism. This means combining oxygen with the end products of glycolysis and with various other cellular foodstuffs to liberate carbon dioxide, water and ATP. Now, how do skeletal muscles move? This it's a question that comes into our minds. It happens when the muscular system and the nervous system work together. That is, somatic signals are sent 
from the cerebral cortex to nerves associated with specific skeletal muscles. The signals or an impulse called an action potential travels through a type of nerve cell called a motor neuron as we can see from the diagram. The transfer of the signal from nerve to muscle takes place at the neuromuscular junction. The neuromuscular junction is the name of the place where the motor neuron reaches a muscle cell. When the nervous system signal reaches the neuromuscular junction, a chemical message is released by the motor neuron. Within the exoplasm of the nerve terminals are located numerous membrane and closed vesicles containing acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter molecule. Between the nerve and the muscle is a narrow space called the synaptic cleft, as we can see from the figure. Acetylcholine must diffuse across this synaptic cleft to reach the receptors in the postsynaptic membrane. Also located in the synaptic cleft is the enzyme acetylcholine esterase. Now, what are the chemical events that take place at the neuromuscular junction? When the wave of depolarization associated with a nerve action potential spreads into the terminal of a motor axon, several processes are set in motion. This is achieved by transmission of action potentials along the T-tubules that penetrate all the way through the muscle fiber from one side of the fiber to the other. As we can see from the diagram, the T-tubule action potentials causes release of calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum inside the muscle fiber in the immediate vicinity of the myofibrils and these calcium ions then cause contraction. This overall process is called the excitation contraction coupling. When the acetylcholine molecules arrive at the postsynaptic membrane after diffusing across the synaptic cleft, they bind to the acetylcholine receptors. When two acetylcholine molecules are bound to a receptor, it undergoes a configurational change that allows the relatively free passage of sodium and potassium ions down their respective electrochemical gradients. The binding of acetylcholine to the receptor is reversible and rather loose. Soon acetylcholine diffuses away and is hydrolyzed by acetylcholine esterase into choline and acetate, terminating its function as a transmitter molecule and the membrane permeability returns to the resting state. The choline portion is taken up by the presynaptic terminal for, re for resynthesis of acetylcholine and the acetate diffuses away into the extracellular fluid. The calcium ions, we can see from the figure here, the role of calcium ions in this excitation contraction coupling. The calcium ions initiate attractive forces between the actin and myosin filaments causing them to slide alongside each other, which is the contractile process. Calcium binds with troponin C and activates myosin ATPase. As myosin ATPase becomes active, tropomyosin is slipped off and G-actin is exposed. ATPase reacts with ATP and releases ADP and PI. Hence, muscle contraction takes place. After a fraction of a second, the calcium ions are pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum by a calcium membrane pump and they remain stored in the reticulum until a new muscle action potential comes along. When calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum away from the actin and myosin, the actin and myosin cannot interact and the muscle relaxes. This removal of calcium ions from the myofibril causes the muscle contraction to cease. Now, let us now learn about the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. As proposed by Nobel laureate Sir A. F. Huxley in 1958, 
The sliding filament theory is the explanation for how muscles contract to produce force. The actin and myosin filaments within the sarcomeres of muscle fibers bind to create cross bridges and slide past one another, creating a contraction. When a muscle contracts, the actin is pulled along myosin towards the center of the sarcomere until the actin and myosin filaments are completely overlapped. In other words, for a muscle cell to contract, the sarcomere must shorten. However, thick and thin filaments, the components of the sarcomeres, do not shorten. Instead, they slide by one another, causing the sarcomere to shorten, while the filaments remain the same length. So here in the figure, number A, which is the top figure, shows a sarcomere in its relaxed position. And number B, that is the lower one, shows a sarcomere in a contracted position where the Z lines move closer together and the I band gets smaller. The A band stays the same width and at full contraction, the thin filaments overlap the thick filaments. Therefore, the sliding filament theory proposes that Changes in overall fiber length are directly associated with changes in the overlap between the two sets of filaments, that is, the thin filaments telescope into the array of thick filaments. This interdigitation accounts for the change in the length of the muscle fiber. Now, let us look into the cross bridge cycle. We all must have come across the term cross bridge cycle. The process of contraction involves a cyclic interaction between the thick and thin filaments which is called as the cross bridge cycle. Now that we know that thin filaments slide over the thick filaments during a muscle contraction, let us examine how the process works in detail. So this is the cross bridge cycle where the steps are shown in a sequence. Now let us examine each step. Step number one, myosin heads split ATP and become reoriented and energized. This is due to the intrinsic ATPase activity of the myosin head, about which we had learned in the previous lecture. Now step two, when the muscle is activated, the actin myosin interaction becomes quite strong and the cross bridges become firmly attached. Initially, the cross bridges extend at right angles from each thick filament, but they rapidly undergo a change in an angle of nearly 45 degrees. The partial rotation of the angle of the cross bridge is associated with the release of the hydrolysis products and inorganic phosphate ion and ADP. Now, what happens in step 3? After the hydrolysis takes place, release of inorganic phosphate from the myosin head causes the head to pivot, pulling the actin filament towards the end of the sarcomere, which is called as the power stroke. The myosin head is now in its low energy state, but it remains attached to actin. Now, step number 4. Following this movement, that is the power stroke, which has resulted in a relative filament displacement of about 10 nanometer, the actin myosin binding is still strong and the cross bridge cannot detach at this point. Here it is known as the rigor cross bridge. Now, for detachment to occur, a new molecule of ATP must bind to the myosin head and undergo hydrolysis to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The energy released during hydrolysis reactivates the myosin head, pivoting it back to its high energy state. The cross bridge cycle starts again from this point when the energized myosin head forms another cross bridge. During muscle contraction, cross bridge cycles occur 
between the thick and thin filaments along the entire length of each sarcomere. This can go on as long as the muscle is activated, a sufficient supply of ATP is available and the physiological limit to shortening has not been reached. If cellular energy stores are depleted as happens after death, the cross bridges cannot detach because of the lack of ATP and the cycle stops in an attached state that is at step number 4. This produces an overall stiffness of the muscle which is observed as the rigor mortis that sets in shortly after death. Now having learned about the muscle contraction including the chemical and the molecular basis, let us now learn about the types of muscle contraction. A muscle fiber generates tension through actin and myosin cross bridge cycling. While under tension, the muscle may lengthen, shorten or remain the same. Although the term contraction implies shortening, when referring to the muscular system, it means the generation of tension within a muscle fiber. So there are two types of muscle contraction. The first one is the isotonic contraction and the second one is the isometric contraction. Iso means equal while tonic means tension. Isotonic contraction is when the muscle moves or shortens and the tension remains the same. That is the tension or the force of contraction developed by the muscle remains almost constant while the muscle changes its length. During an isotonic contraction, the joint moves. An example would be if you flexed your forearm. They are generally used for body movements and for moving objects. The two types of isotonic contractions are concentric isotonic contraction and eccentric isotonic contraction. Isometric contraction is when the length of the muscle remains constant and the tension produced by the muscle increases. Here, the muscle does not shorten during the contraction and the tension in the muscle increases. During an isometric contraction, the joint does not move. It generates force without changing the length of the muscle common in the muscles of the hand and forearm responsible for a grip. An example would be to push your arm against a wall. Now let us have a look at the diagrammatic representation of the different types of muscle contraction. The first one shows an isotonic contraction which is an concentric one. A concentric contraction is a type of muscle contraction in which the muscles shorten while generating force overcoming resistance. For example, when lifting a heavy object, a concentric concentration of the biceps would cause the arm to bend at the elbow, lifting the weight towards the shoulder. Cross bridge cycling occurs, shortening the sarcomere, muscle fiber and muscle. The second one shows an eccentric isotonic contraction. This results in the elongation of a muscle while the muscle is still generating force. In effect, resistance is greater than force generated. Eccentric concentrations may be voluntary and involuntary. For example, a voluntary eccentric contraction would be the controlled lowering of the heavy weight raised during the above concentric contraction. An involuntary eccentric contraction may occur when a weight is too great for a muscle to bear and so it is slowly lowered while under tension. Cross bridge cycling occurs even though the sarcomere, muscle fiber and the muscles are lengthening, controlling the extension of the muscle. The last one shows an isometric contraction. In contrast to isotonic contractions, isometric contractions 
generate force without changing the length of the muscle common in the muscles of the hand and forearm responsible for grip using the example which we just mentioned the muscle contraction required to grip but not move a heavy object prior to lifting would be isometric it is generally used to maintain posture now having learned about skeletal muscle contraction let us just briefly learn about cardiac muscle and smooth muscle contraction cardiac muscle contains actin and myosin and it is striated in the same manner and arranged in sarcomere as in the skeletal muscle these filaments lie side by side along one another during contraction in the same manner as occurs in the sliding uh, skeletal muscle that is by sliding filament mechanism but in other ways cardiac muscle is quite different from skeletal muscle the dark areas as you can see from the diagram crossing the cardiac muscle fibers are called intercalated discs they are actually cell membranes that separate individual cardiac muscle from one another at each intercalated disc the cell membranes fuse with one another in such a way that they form permeable commuting junctions called the gap junctions that allow almost totally free diffusion of ions when one cell is stimulated all cells are stimulated action potentials spread through cardiac muscle through these gap junctions cardiac myocytes have one nucleus each and they undergo spontaneous depolarization now let us learn about smooth muscle contraction smooth muscle has three types of filaments thick myosin filaments which are longer than those found in skeletal muscle thin filaments that contain tropomyosin but lack troponin and filaments of intermediate size that is intermediate filaments that do not act directly participate in contraction but they form part of the cytoskeletal framework that supports cell shape so the mechanism of control of contraction is quite different smooth muscle contains more amount of actin than myosin however smooth muscle does not have the same striated arrangement of actin and myosin filaments as found in the skeletal muscle that is they do not contain sarcomeres further there are few differences between a skeletal and a smooth muscle the thin filaments or the actin filaments are anchored either to the plasma membrane or to the cytoplasmic structures known as dense bodies some of the membrane dense bodies of adjacent cells are bonded together by intracellular protein bridges it is mainly through these bonds that the force of contraction is transmitted from one cell to the next there are also gap junctions in smooth muscles further the contractile process is activated by calcium ions and atp is degraded to adp to provide energy for contraction contraction depends on the rise in free intracellular calcium ions and formation of calcium ion calmodulin complex now let us learn about the properties of muscle contraction the production of skeletal muscle force depends on contractile mechanisms and failure at any of the sites upstream of the cross bridges can contribute to the development of muscle fatigue prolonged and strong contraction of a muscle leads to the well known state of muscle fatigue it is a common non specific symptom experienced by many people and is associated with many health conditions 
often defined as an overwhelming sense of tiredness lack of energy and feeling of exhaustion fatigue relates to a difficulty in performing the voluntary tasks now muscle twitch a muscle twitch is a small involuntary muscle contractions in the body causes of muscle twitch may be muscle fatigue over exertion sleep deprivation intake of too much caffeine and alcohol excessive exercise causing electrolyte imbalance through sweating dehydration stress and anxiety deficiency of calcium magnesium or vitamin d now let us learn about muscle tetanus each motor neuron that leaves the spinal cord innervates multiple muscle fibers with the number of fibers innervated depending on the type of muscle all muscle fibers innervated by a single nerve fiber is called a motor unit a muscle tetanus is a sustained muscle contraction evoked when the motor nerve emits action potentials at a very high rate the tetanic contractions of motor units are the effect of repetitive activations of muscle fibers and the summation of responses to successive stimuli a muscle tetanus is a sustained muscle contraction evoked when the motor nerve that innervates a skeletal muscle emits action potentials at a very high rate now what is summation summation means the adding together of individual twitch contractions to increase the intensity of the overall muscle contraction it may occur in two ways by increasing the number of motor units contracting simultaneously which is called multiple fiber summation or by increasing the frequency of contraction which is called frequency summation and can lead to tetanization Now let us look into the graphical representation of the properties of the skeletal muscle here number a shows a muscle twitch that is a single action potential causes a brief contraction followed by a relaxation number b shows a summation occurs when two stimuli come in rapid succession and the second twitch is greater than the first next is the tetanus that is loss of relaxation between stimuli a contractile mechanism that fuses into one continuous contraction example seizures which are first stimulated by the nervous system but affect the muscle contraction now here as we are reaching the end of the lecture let us quickly go through some interesting facts skeletal muscles only pull in one direction yes and they always come in pairs muscle cells are grouped together in pairs on your skeleton when one muscle in a pair contracts to bend a joint for example its partner then contracts and pulls in the opposite direction to straighten the joint out again here in the figure we can see that there are two sets of arm muscles the contracting triceps and the relaxed biceps here we can see how the two sets of arm muscles move to pull the bone on one side and then the other depending on how the arm is intended to move So isn't this an interesting fact? Yes. Now, if we talk about muscular system pathologies, that is the common disorders and conditions, one of the most common muscular pathologies is myotibular myopathy. It is an X-linked condition that primarily affects the tone and contraction of skeletal muscles. it is most commonly found in males 
the incidence of x linked myotubular myopathy is estimated to be 1 in 50000 newborn males worldwide there is little to no treatment of the disease all that can be done is to manage the affected person's diet and maintain a regular exercise plan now another common muscular system pathology is the carpal tunnel syndrome which is also called the median nerve compression occurs when the tendons become inflamed causing compression of the median nerve in the wrist it can occur for a variety of reasons including hereditary disposition repetitive movements diabetes or thyroid disorders symptoms include pain numbness and eventual weakness in the hand the carpal tunnel is between the carpal ligament that is a flexor retinaculum which restrains and aligns the tendons that move the hand and fingers and the carpal bones of the wrist tendons in the sheaths slide through this passageway adjacent to the median nerve well now what can cause carpal tunnel syndrome if you do a lot of typing or other repetitive motions over a long period of time you might as well get the carpal tunnel syndrome to minimize the problem if you type a lot an ergonomic keyboard is recommended an ergonomic keyboard is a computer keyboard designed with ergonomic considerations to minimize muscle strain and the host of related problems typically such keyboards for two-handed typists are constructed in a v shape to allow right and left hands to type at a slight angle more natural to the human form so having said this we have come to the end of the muscle physiology lecture so here i have also mentioned the books and the related papers that i have gone through while preparing the lecture and which you might also refer for your further perusal so thank you again for listening to me and for any queries or feedback or any confusions please feel free to contact me at the given email id thank you